Hey, what's up, guys? Joel Benavides with the Block Squawk Podcast. It is 11.02, two minutes past 11, here in uh, cool and humid San Antonio, Texas. Can't tell you if the skies are overcast or not, but it was a beautiful and bright sunny day, not a cloud in the sky type thing all day long. So we've had some uh, pretty sporadic weather here in San Antonio, but uh, I guess that's everywhere, right? Pretty weird. Uh, let's see, uh, we got about 49, I'm sorry, uh, 58 minutes left, 57 minutes left, uh, <clears throat> in, uh, April 26th here in the central standard time zone. And we are going to be, uh, moving into the 27th here shortly. It is the 27th, four hours past the 27th or into the 27th here, uh, on the universal clock. And, uh, we are looking at uh, coin 360. We're looking at a snapshot of the market. And uh, it's relatively flat. Uh, I've been looking at Tezos uh, for the last hour or so, and uh, it's the only thing that's significantly up, really. Uh, <clears throat> Nano was fluctuating, but it looks like uh, it's kind of back flat. So there may be some volatility going on with Nano. Uh, <clears throat> but um, we're going to press on with the rest of the podcast. Uh, I haven't been on in like, I don't know, like, three weeks or something like that. Um, only because I've been focusing on, um, uh, another project and I'll get to that reveal towards the end of the stream. Uh, I already ran through the stream once, uh, from like, uh, 10 to 10 30. And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, there, there it is. See nano's kind of fluctuating back up. Maybe, maybe we'll take a look at the chart. Uh, I don't like to focus on some of those lower market cap uh coin see it's back down so something's going on with nano yeah just because whenever you start playing with something outside the top 20 and there's a lot of volatility like that it usually points to bullshit and shady business so i don't want to focus on that <clears throat> so uh so that does it let's uh let's take a look at uh crypto potato and um uh, i am going to run through the top 20 I'm just going to kind of blast uh, through uh, 20 through 12 or so. And then uh, and then we'll get to focusing on uh, like uh, the decent coins. We'll do the uh, speed squawk through the top 10. <clears throat> so let's get started here. <clears throat> 20 uh, coming in at 20th by market cap is Ontology ONT. They're trading at a uh, dollar and a nickel. NEM XCM in at 19th, trading at 5.9 cents. Ethereum Classic in at 18th, trading at five and a half. Neo in at 17th, trading at nine and 38. IOTA in at 16th, trading at 26 cents. Tezos in at 15th, uh, trading at a dollar 19. Dash in at 14th, trading at uh, 109 and uh, nearly a quarter. BSV in at 13th, trading at 54 and 24. Monero uh, in at 12th, uh, our favorite dark coin, XMR, trading at 62 and 28. Uh, and Tron TRX in at 11th, trading at 2.3 cents. Uh, <clears throat> and pretty much everything that we're going to be going through here uh, is... Um, it's pretty flat, guys. Uh, there is some, uh, There was some volatility uh, earlier today, and that's associated with the uh well known well well known to some friday sell off and we can talk about that i've talked about that before on this stream um but uh but weak hands are at play on friday and uh and the strong hands come up and clean up uh the kiddos mess on saturday which is tomorrow so uh so we'll take a look at that um, as well, uh, let's uh, let's speed squawk through the top ten, uh, and then uh, we'll get onto the news and 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 to looking at the charts and whatever else. So and announcements, etc. So uh, let's get started. It's six minutes past eleven uh, p.m. Central Standard Time, and uh, six minutes past four on the Universal Clock on the twenty seventh of April. And uh, let's do the top ten squawk now, guys. <clears throat> All right, coming in at 10th by market cap is Cardano ADA trading at 6.8 cents. That's up 0 0.13 points on the day, down 3.17 points on the week. 24 hour trade volume was 60 
correction, 66.4 million. Stellar XLM in at ninth, trading at 9.9 .9 cents, down 0 0.1 points on the day, down 2.14 points on the week. 24 hour traded volume with 154 million. Tether USDT in at eighth, trading at 99 cents. That's up 0 0.09 points on the day, up 1.03 points on the week, and 24 hour traded volume was 10.1 billion. That's standard for Tether, tether guys, since it's a dollar analog. Uh, it's used especially like on Binance. Uh, for a lot of uh, uh, cross dollar trade. So it's a dollar analog. So uh, just because it's got like a huge 24 hour trade volume isn't really saying a lot because uh, a lot of uh, American investors or investors that are working with uh, USD will use USDT on certain exchanges. Uh, that's for those of you who aren't aware. But, um, <clears throat> you know, it's a mixed audience, mixed bag. So sometimes I include uh, that kind of like. Um, uh, entry level uh, information to say it in a nice way. Nice way. Moving on, uh, Binance BNB in at seventh by market cap, trading at 22 and 65. That's down 0 0.64 points on the day, down nearly a quarter of a point for the weekend. 24 hour traded volume was 282.4 million. EOS by the same symbol in at six, trading at four and 76, up 0 0.06 points on the day, down 1.27 points on the week. 24 hour traded volume was 1.7 billion. Litecoin LTC in at fifth, trading at 73 and three. That's up 0 0.06 points on the day, down two. 2.36 points on the week, 24 hour trade volume is 2.3 billion. Uh, Litecoin in at fifth, LTC trading at uh, 73 and three. I might've covered that already, excuse me. Uh, that's of 0 0.06 points on the day, down 2.36 points on the week, 24 hour trade volume is 2.3 billion. Bitcoin Cash, BCH in at fourth, trading at 265 and 35. That's down 0 0.37 points on the day, down 3.65 points on the week, 24 hour trade volume, 699.2 million XRP known as Ripple. Uh, in a third by market cap, trading at 29.9 cents. That's down 0 0.36, 0 0.36 points on the day, but up 0 0.46 points on the week. 24 hour trade of volume was 994.4 million. Uh, Ethereum ETH, ETH ETH in its second by market cap trading at 156 and 86 that's up 0 0.08 points on the day down 1.04 points on the week and 24 hour trade of volume is 4.9 billion. Uh, Bitcoin BTC in at first, trading at 5,274.89, down 0 0.32 points on the day, down 2.3 points on the week, 24-hour trade volume, 11.4 billies. And that's going to do it for the market cap squawk. Uh, let's move on, guys, uh, to, uh, let's see, what we're going to do here. I think we're going to do, uh, yeah, let's just do uh, trending news first, and then we'll talk about uh, something uh, interesting that happened on on Twitter earlier. <clears throat> so uh, recently, over the last hour or two, 21 minutes ago from Crypto Slate, Wirex lists XLM or Stellar uh, in a partnership launching local fiat-based stable coins. 36 minutes ago from uh, Tony Bay's uh, YouTube channel, Mexico City Meetup, live trading a QA. and a uh, 40 minutes ago from the dailyhodl.com, crypto insiders weigh in on Tether debacle as accused exchange moves to 20% of BTC trading volume. <clears throat> yeah, so um, so there's some uh, there's some stuff going on. Uh, Voorhees comment on it. Well, that's what we're going to talk about later uh, between like uh, Tether and uh, Bitfinex and stuff like that. Like it kind of goes deeper. I'm not going to go too deep on it, but I am going to cover it briefly. And uh, about an hour ago from Coindesk.com, Paxos to issue up to 100 million of stable coins on Ontology blockchain. Ontology is like some fascinating stuff, guys. Like um, <laughs> when I first heard about it, I, I was thinking of um, of oncology. I was like, okay, maybe it's like a, a crypto for like eye doctors or something like that. That's not what ontology is at all. It's not on or not. Um, I mean, cancer. I thought it was like a cancer thing, oncology. But it, I just wasn't looking at it. Uh, ontology is really fascinating. You guys should check it out. It's um, it's a little too like uh, metaphysical for me to go over on this stream. I mean, maybe I will at some point. But uh, nevertheless, it's interesting. Let's take a look at some trending stories uh, over the last day or so, and uh, and then we'll move on. Um, Trying to figure out why this thing is. Uh... Yeah, it looks like it's a dead link. Now let's just do it from here. <clears throat> so uh, six hours ago, major exchange E-Trade reportedly integrating 
Bitcoin and Ethereum for 5 million users. Yeah, um, I was talking about that earlier on the pre-stream. Uh, E-Trade uh, is going to be allowing uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum trading on their platform. And I talked a little bit about, uh, let, me, uh, let me look at you real quick. So I talked a little bit uh, on the, on the pre-stream about how uh, E-Trade, well, for those of you who don't know, E-Trade is like a, a traditional markets trading platform. So like uh, think like TD Ameritrade, interactive brokers, that kind of stuff. And so you can get on there, you can get an account. It's just like getting a bank account, except it's an, a, a, an investment bank account. And, um, and you can trade markets. Uh, you don't necessarily have to be a pattern day trader. You don't have to have like, you know, a, 25 grand in there uh, although you do need 25 grand um, to trade more than more make more than three trades in a week uh, but you know if you're just looking to buy and sell on uh, on, a, on a weekly basis uh, it's usually uh, and this isn't financial advice uh, but the reason I think it's safe for me to make uh, a trade a week is because, um, see, there's this rule, for those of you who don't know, uh, called pattern day trading. And if you are intending to make more than three trades uh, during the course of a week, um, it's um, you need 25 grand in your, in your trading account. Uh, that's a legal thing. You'll get flagged if you try to trade more than three times a week. And it's really kind of the, the, the number three is really kind of a catch-22 if you think about it. Again, this is financial advice. Uh, nothing you hear is financial advice, but in my opinion, and for me, it's kind of a catch 22, uh, to make three trades because if you, uh, buy a security, uh, or, a, you know, a lot of, you know, something, whatever, uh, on a, a traditional exchange or whatever, that's your first trade. Uh, you have to monitor the price and the market to make sure that, uh, things don't get bad right now, depending on how you. What, and what you mark is bad or what your risk tolerance is, whatever. Um, <clears throat> you want to have another trade available to you to get out, right? Uh, if, you're, if you're long biased, right? So if you're long biased and you've already bought something, you need to hang on to that, that uh, second trade to, to sell your position, to close your position out. Uh, because if you decide to close your position out and then... You want to come back in with that third trade? Well, now you're locked into it for the rest of the week, no matter what happens. So the market tanks or whatever, you're not going to be able to get a position without getting flagged as a, as a pattern day trader. And, and at that point, you need 25 grand in the account. Why you would want to uh, trade traditional markets with any frequency without 25 grand is, is beyond me. So I think it's a good rule. Um, but it's just something to be aware of, something that uh, <clears throat> you will become aware of if you uh, research this with any kind of frequency eventually. So, uh, and I guess that raises another question, right? So like, because crypto is what it is, is E-Trade going to be allowing more than three trades on their platform? Everything else is, is operating on these traditional uh, brokers you know, under the pattern day trading rule. So if I get an E-Trade account and I start trading crypto on like E-Trade, or let's say that my broker TD Ameritrade uses um, or starts implementing crypto trading, am I still going to be limited? Well, I mean, why would I trade on, on E-Trade or TD Ameritrade crypto if I'm going to be limited to the pattern day trading rule? So that's an interesting question that I'm definitely going to research. Um, you know, I, I might even call E-Trade up. Uh, and and I, I might even call TD Ameritrade up and ask them if they intend on on uh, allowing that stuff. That's a good idea. Uh, I think I'm going to do that. If not by the next <clears throat> um, episode, then then definitely soon. Uh, so let's, uh, I'm, I'm going off on all sorts of tangents right now. Let me let me get back into this. So uh, that was that was from uh, CryptoSlate.com and, and two two more sources. Uh, eight hours ago from CryptoGlobe.com, IOTA launches its own academy to help users learn more about its technology, and that's good, uh, guys. Um, I, I am going to go off on another tangent here. I want to talk about this. So, uh, in terms of like uh, learning 
how to operate cryptocurrency. You know, think about, you got to think about like when stuff like this happened. And of course, in the past, in history, and of course, the most recent example is uh, is uh, the internet and like email and stuff like that, right? So you go back, you look at when they were, that video where, where um, uh, Katie Couric and uh, Brian Gumbel is on Good Morning America and they're talking about uh, what email is and what the internet is, um, they really sound silly, right? I mean, we just take all that stuff for granted now. Uh, but back then, they really didn't know, and people really didn't know anything about the internet. People were avoiding the internet because it was so complicated. Uh, but nowadays, everybody just kind of assumes that it works and that it does what it says it is, and for the most part, it's secure. And, um, and so, you know, like... I think that that'll eventually happen with crypto. Um, who was it uh, that I was talking about on the pre-screen? Made a comment. Oh, oh, it was um, you know, it was on it was on Twitter earlier. Sangalucci uh, had retweeted somebody talking about how the uh, UX UI, the u the user interface and user experience problem uh, with crypto is so far and away complicated uh, that common people are not going to get involved and. That did happen for a little while with email and internet. People just did not want to get involved initially. Uh, but there are those uh, brave explorers among us who do get involved, who do delve deep into the technical aspect. I'll never forget uh, my uncle. My uncle Bobby uh, was into internet and uh, bulletin board systems, BBSs, before anybody. So I remember going over to my, my cousin Frankie and Justin's house and, uh, and his dad, Bobby, would show us uh, the internet and we'd get onto all these like different BBSs. There were some with like games and it, there was one that was like a, a modern or, a, or an antiquated version of modern day Google images where you could just like Google different images for whatever kind of like projects you wanted to do. It's just, it was super fascinating, right? And, uh, and uh, you know, this was back in the days of like DOS and like text, like uh, text-based uh, internet connections. And, you know, I mean, uh, 56K, 56 baud modem dial-up internet was considered lightning fast back then. So, you know, it would take us a minute or two to download these pictures. And we thought that it was just amazing back then. And so, uh, so we have those people among us. And those are the folks that are going to kind of drag everybody else into, sorry, into um, the uh, Bitcoin world. So even if you're not into this stuff, you probably have like a nerd at work or a nerd in the family who's talking about it or knows about it. Bring it up during the next, you know, Christmas dinner or um, or Easter celebration or what have you. Whenever the, when the family gets together, funeral, wedding, whatever, and I'm sure you you got somebody or you know somebody um, who's who's heavy into this and will talk your ear off. And that's the way it's going to be for a while. Um, even if the UX doesn't come right away, you know, we didn't have Java you know, in uh, uh, Java-based websites until, what, like 2007, 2008? So when that started kicking up, back then everything else was like HTML and it was like kind of shitty looking and you had to get into the code if you wanted to adapt or change the way your MySpace page looked. So, um, you know, it's going to take a while, but it is coming, guys. It is coming. Um so uh, moving on, 13 hours ago from BitcoinNews.com, Brave browser rewards rollout. Um, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna chase it. 19 hours ago, Saudi British bank launches Ripple-powered instant cross-border transfer services. You know, another example. Again, three sources, heavily syndicated. Another example of um, of high-level institution-based uh, trading using Ripple. And I wonder how this is affecting the forex markets. I haven't gone in to look at um you know charts of like say uh you know the dollar pound when a dollar pound type announcement comes out uh concerning ripple and stuff like that so it'd be interesting to look at a com comparison chart of like some of these forex exchanges based off of ripple I, I wonder if there's any kind of dynamic going on there that might be something that um somebody might want to look into <clears throat> or somebody is looking into 
um, about 24 hours ago or more than over 24 hours ago uh, from Coindesk.com and six more sources, Bitfinex covered 850 million loss using tether funds, New York prosecutors allege. Yeah, so this is associated with, uh, with all that tether news that's going on, but tether remains at 99 cents. So uh, let's take a look at uh, some of this. Yeah, so here we can see from CCN.com, 850 million Bitfinex bombshell disproves crazy Bitcoin conspiracy. So this was a, a tweet uh, that came out uh, earlier today, I think, um, yeah, around 1107 in the morning uh, from Eric Voorhees. Ironically, this latest Bitfinex drama, maybe the, he means Bitfinex slash Tether, uh, drama may be the one thing that disproves the Bitfinex conspiracy theory that if USD in that amount was seized or stolen, held by crypto capital, then the USD backing Tether did actually exist after all. And then he um, cites Bitfinex to claim was that USD never existed. So uh, they may have, in fact, uh, had the uh, funds backing it. Uh, all very fascinating stuff, guys. <clears throat> so that's just um, basically that's just a question as to whether um, the cryptocurrency, the, the the dollar analog tether, did in fact have the equal amount of funds uh, in the bank backing whatever it was that. Um, that they claim to, you know, back in their market cap and stuff like that. So uh, let's take a look at this. Right now we're looking at Bitfinex. I want to briefly, I'm going to kind of bridge the, the, the Coinbase chart, which is what I've been using with the Bitfinex chart. Because I've always kind of uh, felt slightly uncomfortable with my own use of the Coinbase chart, uh, and I guess I just wanted to hear uh, somebody that I trust and respect uh, say what I had been thinking in order to uh, begin executing my analysis on Bitfinex. Although I do not trade on Bitfinex, um, <clears throat> there's a significant amount of global volume. The reason that I use Coinbase is because uh, I buy this. Coinbase can be a little more expensive, um, just a little, uh, but uh, there's a large amount of um, U.S. volume uh, coming into Coinbase, and um, especially during uh, times when the market is up, you know, a lot of uh, um, uh, American speculators and investors will come in through uh, Coinbase, and uh, I'm not sure how well they've been doing, but uh <laughs> sorry you guys just saw that um so uh so yeah coinbase is uh is it is what it is you know i'm uh, but i think that we need to um to focus on bitfinex just because most of the volume is coming through there um, so, but I do want to come back here and you can see the results of a back test that I did on the stochastic indicator. I believe that was on the, this was probably on the, yeah, this was on the four hour. So I was doing um, a, uh, a back test, a stochastic based back test um, where I impl implemented a stochastic K and D crossover um, along with like i mean there was like four requirements basically there had to be a stochastic crossover uh with the k and d line it had to occur or they both had to move above or below the overbought and oversold lines and there had to be associated with some kind of um bullish pattern so like a bull flag or whatever and so that's what you're looking at down here uh on the top and the bottom of the uh stochastic indicator um and throughout here throughout the, the chart. I didn't have that on. I, I Last time I, I, I streamed, I, mainly I was just uh, talking about patterns and trends. Uh, and we're going to look at that. If you want to go back and get like a full comprehensive look at what I've been up to, um, whatever platform you're consuming this on, take a look 
at episode 44 and 45 and that'll kind of get you up to speed but basically we left off right around here right around the 24th or 25th of march um and i was noting that we were in a like an appointed divergence because the pattern that was in effect which was like a triangle triangle based pattern um and the um and the support and resistance zone that we were operating in, the, the range that we were operating in, was getting ready to diverge. And so after I finished episode 45, it did briefly diverge from both, in fact. It moved out of the uh, triangle formation. It took a bearish break to the downside. And then it continued outside of that zone of support and resistance that we have been operating in. But it, it only remained outside for a moment, you know, for like a, a day or two. Um, it, it, it bounced off of this, uh, this uh, line of deviation or zone of deviation on this pitchfork and then came right back up into that um, support and resistance zone. Uh, tested uh, a couple of times over a couple of candles on the four hour and then it started um, a uh, bullish break upwards, right? Uh, so I had been watching that um, and uh, I did not, an I, I anticipated a break to the upside. I did not anticipate it, it was gonna be this big, right? I think, uh, let me measure it real quick. So uh, it, was a, it was approximately, uh, let's see, over the three bars that it was uh, bullish initially, it was a 20%, over 20% um, bullish break to the upside. And so, um, you know, I was, uh, I was thinking that we were going to follow suit and kind of uh, platform out for a very long time. And we may still be doing that, guys, right? Because we continue to have higher highs, depending on how you're looking at it, and then higher lows, higher highs, and slightly higher lows. At least if, if you're looking at the line chart and you're looking at closing prices on the line chart, we definitely have higher highs and higher lows, right? And so when you're doing long-term Dow style uh, theory and analysis, you know, when you're acting like a big boy, uh, you wanna focus on those types of things. Um, you wanna look on the day chart of the four hour chart, some of the best uh, traders, institutional traders who are moving real money, who are, um, who are manipulating the market um, with real money uh, are paying attention to these things. You know, um, uh, Scott Barkley, he uh, used to trade in the pits with uh, FXDD and, and all these like big time brokers. You know, he said in interviews before, you know, the market doesn't turn in the middle of nowhere. You know, it's like the, like the big institutional bankers that are moving, like this is in the Forex world, obviously, but um, they're moving big big bucks and he says you know we all us retail traders can take all the money we have and and click the candle at the same time and we wouldn't even put a shadow on a wick that's almost a direct quote uh he's like but they but they can move it them meaning the big boys the institutional bankers can move it because they're moving large large amounts of money and so uh, i don't have access to level two anymore but um a lot of the times level two uh on these larger moves looks looks similar i don't know um where some of these level two charts come from. I haven't done my due diligence in that respect because I haven't really traded off of level two, um, but I, I should be I should be trading off a of reputable level two. I just don't know what if, it, if it exists in in the in the crypto world yet. Um, another uh, question of due diligence that needs to be reviewed. So, um, and and I've been meaning to look at that. But anyway, uh, onto the matter at hand. Uh, oh shit! I didn't mean to do that. Get back there. Thank God for the undo button in trading view, guys. Uh, I really need to lock these, but you know that that undo button is helpful. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm a, I'm a little concerned, right? Because when we broke out to the upside, there was a lot of uncertainty on this uh, bullish move, and uh, I interpret it as uncertainty when I look at like these long wicks, right? And so that, that, that kind of uncertainty and these kind of long, you know, these candles right here are all wick and no body, you know, point to this kind of uncertainty that ends up in a, in a, in a bearish break to the downside. Uh, you know, when it gets tight, when those candles get tight and candles end up being all body and very little wick, 
um, in my humble opinion, you tend to have these bullish breakouts to the upside. Uh, so, and you can see this phenomenon repeat. Uh, it's especially more visible now that we've uh, that some volatility has returned. Um, and so we continue to monitor. Usually there's a little bit of uncertainty after a, a, a large breakout to the upside or the downside, but, the, but you wanna watch and see if that uncertainty continues or if it starts to tighten up. And it looks like that's what's happened over like the last eight hours or so here. So uh, we're about to have um, uh, another daily candle close here on the hour. And so we'll have to wait and see. I'm sorry, not a daily candle, uh, a four hour candle close here within about 20, 27 minutes or so. So we'll continue to monitor. I won't be uh, uh, trading, but I'll, I'll probably tweet that out. I'll probably be doing some editing and not editing, but uh, posting on, on Spotify and, and YouTube and stuff like that. And we'll continue to monitor. Uh, but essentially, uh, let's, uh, let's get uh, some, uh, some rays out. I don't know why I ha don't have that. Um, so the, so you want to find the highest, essentially when you're doing responsible technical analysis, pull up a line and you want to find like the two or three highest, uh, candles, right? At least the, the highest two. And that's going to be right here for me. And you're going to work your way back in, in discovery in, in closing cost discovery, you work your way back for the highs, you know, if it's an upward trend. You're going to do support. If it's a downward trend, you're going to do resistance. So essentially right here, uh, we made a new low and I'm going to take that along with this close that we got right afterwards. Right. Um, but because trading view works the way it does, I'm going to, I'm going to do price discovery in reverse, but I'm going to draw, uh, forward. Right. So I'm going to look for a close right there. I'm going to get that little close right there. And I'm going to draw this out this way. And I'm going to get that close. Uh, from here on out, guys, I can uh, copy this candle, or I'm sorry, copy this trend line and uh, clone it, bring it up top. And I am not going to be inclusive, guys. I'm going to only be so much inclusive enough to where I can get a couple of highs and a couple of lows. And, uh, and it's pretty spot on. I, I got it right there. I got the closes that I need, essentially. Right. And then there's going to be other deviations further in towards the middle. But essentially, this is our trend right here. And so um, and so and that's good. We, we were able to before this, before uh, today, guys, we were operating along this line. You can see it right here on the upper edge of this pitchfork. Uh, that was our, our bottom of this trend. Um, and so we'll continue to monitor. Um, keep in mind this trend. Um, it's not really a bull flag, right? Cause bull flags tend to retrace a little bit and it is going up, right? So there, in my opinion, there may be some uncertainty here. Uh, we may be, uh, needing a pullback. And so, uh, so it now may, uh, if you're a Fibonacci trader, maybe a, a good time to start looking at your Fibonacci's, uh, both up and down. Let's take a look at stochastics. So uh, stochastics are slightly oversold. That may be because we just had a drop down, but uh, but it's not completely oversold. And we're whipsawing on the on the K and D lines. Um, you'll notice that I look at indicators at the very end, guys. Very there's a handful of things that I wanted to talk to you about, and they're not popping up in my head right now. So um, I'll have to tweet them out later. Um, if you're not following me on Twitter, follow me on Twitter. I'm at Joel Benavides. That's J-O-E-L-B-E-N-A-V-I-D-E-Z. And uh, I don't uh, uh, pretend to regard myself as any kind of expert. I'm just a, a, a guy on a journey, on a mission. And so uh, so that's where we're at, guys. I wouldn't be surprised if, um, if we bounce around here for a little bit and then drop down uh, a little bit more. However... Saturday is a big buying day. So that might not happen right away. Maybe it happens next week. Maybe uh, we, we keep this act up uh, over the next, uh, the next week or so. Maybe we'll drop down uh, next Friday. But I mean, we'll see. We'll see how things, things go. This is turning out to be a longer uh, episode than I intended. But I, again, it has been a while, guys. I wanted to let some, some price action develop before I came back and talked to you. So we'll continue to monitor. I'll be a little bit more active. 
Um, but I am not going to be all in until episode 50. Uh, episode 50 is going to be kind of like a shift and we're going to remain locked in for uh, hopefully about 50 days. I'm making that commitment right now. When I start episode 50, the gun is going to go, the starting gun is going to go off and we're going to be uh, locked in for 50. So if you haven't started following me yet, if you don't have post notifications on in Twitter and YouTube and Spotify, et cetera, et cetera, get that done. And, uh, and we'll, uh, I mean, it may be repetitive stuff towards the end, but regardless, I'm going to do uh, 50 days um, because I wanted to uh, kind of give it a good old college try and see how the data stacks up at the end of those 50 days and maybe 50 days after those 50 days. Uh, so your help is going to be uh, remarkably important uh, with respect to that stuff. Um And, uh, and that's going to be it for us, guys. I'm going to get out of here. Um, there is one thing that I wanted to talk to you guys about before I leave. And uh, that is uh, what I've been doing, why I've been gone for three weeks, right? And so um, so let me show you. Let me show you what, what I've been up to briefly. Um, Local host. I don't know if it's gonna allow me to do that. Yeah, yeah, I can't do that right now. I need to open up Jupyter Notebooks. So essentially, uh, the reason that I've been uh, up to this or uh, gone, guys, is because I've been uh, learning Python, right? And uh, the reason that I've been learning Python. Uh, is because um, I kind of started doing this back test, right, that you can see here. And I kind of came to a couple of realizations. One, um, you know, I could do a manual back test, and it's, it's not incredibly difficult to do back tests, but you're always going to kind of throw in your long bias or your short bias. And so sometimes when there's uh, a crossover and it's borderline say you get a K uh, line or a D line go above or below but you don't get the other and it doesn't exactly meet all your criteria but it looks positive you, and you kind of have to start relying on uh, secondary and tertiary indicators it's um, it's really easy to let your bias get involved in, in those moments and um, and I don't want to uh, turn this into a, uh, like, a, I, 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 you know, it's the, it's the, it's the game, right? It's the, uh, the emotional game, the psychological game. And so, uh, quant traders and HFT traders and algorithmic traders, like, um, they don't really operate that way. You know, they kind of, uh, turn the machines on and walk away and just kind of monitor price and monitor risk and reward i can do that like uh but i don't want to be like one of these uh tick by tick guys or you know i want to be able to put some reliance on you know an algorithm where my emotions might get in the way and so i started kind of learning it it's going to be a long journey guys but mainly i just wanted it for back testing um i still plan to uh execute in a discretionary way especially when it comes to risk uh, risk analysis and risk reward, etc. Uh, but I decided that the only way to actually do uh, due diligence uh, is to put my own nose in this because if you're relying on somebody else uh, to write your code for you, uh, it's not exactly due diligence. So um, I've uh, decided to uh, take a class with uh, uh, Perian. Uh, data and uh, and I've been learning about like sets and booleans and dictionary just doing basic data structure within Python um, and then after that there's uh, a, uh, a a course that I'll be taking uh, for uh, dictionaries in the uh, in the finance world um, and uh, and I have that and I've kind of done like a cursory uh, review of those courses but I mean, they're already in the pipeline. They're already bought and paid for. And so I'm uh, just kind of going through some of that stuff right now. Uh, 
and kind of working with like uh, sets and booleans, etc. cetera. Uh, but so this is what I've been up to, just um, learning how to code, learning how to code well, learning how to code so that other people can read the code. Um, and uh, there's real basic stuff right now, guys, uh, but, but that's what I've been up to. So obviously when I lock myself in to those 50 episodes, uh, doing that and trying to accomplish this at the same time is obviously going to be extremely labor intensive. Uh, it's going to, it's going to take a lot. And so, uh, but it'll, it'll, it'll be good for me. I'll be able to focus on, on, uh, my process, my, um, daily process, my documenting. Cause that's another thing like, you know, if you want to be, uh, successful at trading, uh, long-term documentation and review, uh, is really important and so uh, learning to code in a in the in a good way is actually really helpful if you're documenting what you're doing it's like there's no way anybody else is going to be able to read your code if you're not documenting it properly and so uh, I'm really excited about that I'm really excited about uh, being forced into a um, uh, a responsible and comprehensive uh, documentation regime so really cool stuff but that's what I've been up to and uh, and that's where I'll be but um, I will come back up to you I'm not making any promises about when I'll be back uh, I do want uh, there to be some price formation over the next uh, four or five episodes um, and then whenever I come back for 50 uh, the idea is that we'll be locked in for for a couple of months all right um, so, uh, time now guys at 1144 PM local, uh, 444, uh, uh, AM on the universal clock. And, uh, I'm out of here guys. I'm, uh, I'm going to do my editing, uh, get this stuff, uh, uploaded and, and, and be done with, with it. Um, but I will be back, uh, hopefully in, uh, half a week, maybe a week. And, uh, we'll see how this played out. And, uh, if it didn't play out. Uh, we'll, of course, cover all that stuff, too. Um, so uh, that's going to do it for us. I'll see you guys later. Hit me up on Twitter. Uh, email me at joel.benavis at gmail.com. And, uh, and uh, good luck trading, guys. We'll see you guys on the flip. Cheers. <laughs>